we're going to talk about this curriculum treasure hunt. How many of you find yourselves lost in this cycle of evaluation? So you pick a curricula for a specific subject area, like language arts, or you might pick it for math, or you've found the perfect science book, and you bring it home, and then you go to your favorite homeschool discussion board and someone brings up the one you didn't buy. <laughs> the one that you decided not to get, or maybe the one you haven't heard of, and it completely jars you. You find yourself doubting your decision. You're like, maybe I made the wrong choice. And so then what do you do? Well, you can either feel bad about what you're using, or you can go and buy this second one, and now you've got two, both of which you're not using, right? <laughs> and pretty soon you accumulate curricula. Whenever I speak on um, conventions and at conferences, I always ask people to raise their hand based on how many writing manuals they own. And would you believe that at my very first workshop, it was at the... Um, Ohio State Convention back in 2001, a woman owned 13 writing manuals, 13. How many of you own more than five writing manuals? Tap the screen for hearts or say yes in the little window. Yeah, we're getting some hearts. <laughs> exactly, hey Allie, welcome you new homeschool mama. Love having you. Yeah, we all tend to accumulate curricula in the subject areas that where we feel insecure. We keep buying, that's right, and the more that you buy, <laughs> oh, someone said just Brave Writer manuals, does that count? Well, interestingly, the Brave Writer materials address a variety of needs. What I'm talking about is the duplication of effort. So you might own, you know, three spelling manuals or four first grade math textbooks. There's this tendency to think we're not getting it all done, that we're not covering it all, or that some other program's gonna do better than the one we currently own. Um, so yes, you understand. I can see that you do because you're all responding positively. Well, here's what I wanna share with you first of all. And we're gonna go through, let me count my tips. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven tips. We're gonna whip through them. And then at the end, there's a pro tip and then at the very end, I have a special announcement for October that is about a discount in Brave Writer. So if you stay to the end or you catch the replay later, you'll get all of that. But I just wanted you to know. Yeah, someone said they were a recovering curriculum junkie. Totally. Who isn't, right? So here's the thing. When we're thinking about curriculum, we tend to move away from the focus of the education we're trying to give our kids. Let me say that again. When we're in the zone of curriculum hunting, we're often moving away from the education that we want for our kids. We've moved into a different mode. It's like shopping. So think of it this way. You know you have a wedding coming up and you know you need a dress for this wedding. But if you just go shopping for clothes, you may not end up with a wedding dress. You'll come home with, you know, a brand new coach bag and a pair of jeans and a cute top. <laughs> And you think, well, I've got clothes, but it's still not really getting me to the wedding. And then you see your friend on her favorite blog, and she's got a cute scarf, and you go out and buy a scarf. But you still don't have what you need for this wedding, right? So before you can pick curricula, you have to have yourself a, a little conversation with yourself about education. What are my goals? Who are my children? What are we trying to accomplish this year, right? And I've already done periscopes that deal with brains and deal with the enchanted space that we all want to share in our homeschool and the way we want to relate to our children. So you can go back and watch those to get that foundation. But what I want to say today, thank you for sharing to go more slowly. <laughs> I will. What I want to say today is that the foundation you're trying to create is an environment that supports the use of any curriculum you purchase. In other words, you can't really make progress in any program if you feel insecure with the one you're using or if you flip from program to program to program. What we wanna do first is take back the homeschooling space and make sure that we're protecting how it's going to feel. And the first part of that is realizing what kind of atmosphere. I mean, do we really want our kids working in six workbooks a day? 
Will you buy that next workbook if you realize you've already got four? Do you really want a fifth one in a fifth subject? So before we get going, I want you to just sort of think to yourself, curriculum is a support to your education. It isn't the education. You got that? Thank you for inviting your friends. The temptation is to think the education is in the book, but the education is in you, the parent. The book is merely a tool, okay? So that's where we're starting. We're starting with this educational environment and curriculum is a tool. So I'm gonna dive right into my points now because I think they'll cover all the pieces that will help you with this. So the first one is this. Who has heard of open and go curricula? You know, the kind that magically leaps from the UPS box and self-teaches to your children. <laughs> you know the one. It's like you don't even have to read the instructions. Suddenly they magically know how to do math. Has anyone heard of open and go? All right. So our first point is this. The myth of open and go. I call it a myth, and here's why. It's not that I don't believe that it's possible for some products to be so simple to use you need minimal preparation. Think about it. Handwriting books, how hard are they to teach? You could probably read the little paragraph at the front of a handwriting book, have a pretty strong sense of how to implement, and sit down and start within minutes. That's about as close to open and go as you get, handwriting books. But one of the myths of open and go is that the more compli complicated subjects, the ones that you find difficult teaching, you sort of want the product that will make it the most simple to communicate and requires the least exertion from you. And that doesn't exist. The truth of the matter is this. You do have to do a little preparation to maximize curriculum. That's just the truth. And the problem is we're so busy and we're already in the middle of homeschool, we can't figure out when to do it. Do you know what I mean? How many of you think, I know I'd be a better math teacher if I read the teacher's manual, but I don't have time. So we're just gonna dive into chapter one. Who has that experience? Oh, look, we're already seeing that. I'm feeling that now, says Allie. Alicia says guilty. Sarah says it makes sense. Oh, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. So I have a tip for you for how to become proficient with the curricula you already have. There isn't a magical one out there. The stuff you already have, we're gonna, we're gonna try it before we ditch it, but we've gotta get to know it first. So here's my second tip, ready? And you, you happy commenters, write these tips into the comments for new people as they stream in if you invite your followers. And just a reminder, I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. Okay, here we go, second tip what I call real-time self-education. What do I mean by that? You get to read the owner's manual of the curriculum in the smack dab center of your homeschooling day. How many of you believe that you're not allowed to look at how to teach the material unless your kids are out of view? Anyone else? So you think, okay, I've got this book. I know there's some teaching instructions in the front of it, but I can't look at those unless the kids are asleep and my husband or wife is out of view and I'm alone. How many think you have to be alone to read the teaching portion of any curricula? Anybody? I see hearts, so I'm gonna assume that means yes. I had that misimpression. I thought for some reason I'm supposed to be out of the house or tucked away in a room. Literally, I remember this. I was teaching Noah math. And we were using Mi Quan Math at the time, which is a pretty simple system. Once you understand how to use Cuisinaire rods, they're just little workbooks. And we got to fractions. I was terrible at fractions. I'm not all that good at math. I couldn't remember how you got a common denominator. So I said to Noah, I said, um, watch the little kids and I'll be right back. I went off to my garage, <laughs> closed the door, got out the book and started figuring out how to do the fractions in another room with the door closed, like so he wouldn't be able to see me in case it looked like I didn't know what I was doing. So I came back in, we sat down, we did fractions. He caught on very quickly. The kid has an amazing mathematical mind. He says to me at the end of the lesson, so mom, 
Um, I only need to know these fractions for like right now while I'm in school, but once I'm an adult, I won't need to know them. <laughs> and I was like, um, well, um, and I just suddenly stammered, right? What I had to realize is that what I am showing him by sneaking away is this idea that somehow I should already know, but he was right on to me. He saw, he saw that I wasn't confident in fractions and I needed to think through what is the practical application and how have I been getting by without doing this kind of fraction conversion? And so it forced me into a real conversation with Noah. And what I realized at that point and what I started doing after that is I decided to go ahead and simply do my preparation right in the middle of the homeschool day. So this is what I did. I would pull out a book and let's say it was time to learn how to use a spelling book, which we did in the early days until I discovered copywork and dictation. Or let's say I pulled out Winston Grammar. I would just work on it right in front of the kids. I would say to them, you know, go play, um, take care of the toddler, watch a movie, and I would read the material right then and there. Why did I do that? Because I wanted them to see that I also needed to learn in order to be good at my job, just like they needed to learn. Secondly, I didn't have any other time. If I was going to be an effective home educator, I needed to use the time that I had. And that's the time that was right in the middle of the day when I was the most alert. There's no problem with that. Oh, I love this. That's what someone says she tells her kids when she's watching the scopes. Exactly. So it's perfectly acceptable. If you want to, you can just go ahead, take the middle of the day and prepare yourself. Okay. So the first tip was open and go is a myth. The second tip was use the real time in your day to educate yourself about your materials. Okay. The third one, here's your third tip. Ready? Give the curricula the good old college try. Give it a try until you've read the teacher's guidelines or how it's implemented. And until you've actually tried it with your kids, you don't know if it works and it's not going to reveal itself within two days. You got to give it a month, give it three weeks. You want time to figure it out. Some of these programs require a really big change in your brain. If you're dealing with, you know, quiz and air rods, things that I had never used as a child, I needed time to play with them. I needed time to experience Mi Kwan's really weird way of looking at math, which by the way, taught me math. The things I didn't learn when I was in elementary school, I learned teaching them to my children using that math program. And that's probably happened to you. You'll be reading along and you'll suddenly get this insight and you're like, oh, I get it now. This curriculum delivered it. But at the initial, it can feel uncomfortable, awkward, not, new, not familiar, right? So give it a college try before you abandon it. You can also say that to your children. We're gonna try this. We're gonna try it. We're gonna see how it feels. We're gonna allow ourselves to experience it. Rebecca says, sometimes you feel you're ditching something and then it leads you <laughs> to Brave Rider. That's very nice, Rebecca. Yes, so learning in front of your children and also giving a system a chance, finding out if it works before you ditch it just because you had three difficult days. Read carefully and give it a fair shot. Clear the decks. This leads us to my next principle, which is familiar to anyone who knows Brave Writer. Okay, ready? The one thing at a time principle. You can't learn three curricula simultaneously. So if the math program you're using is brand new to you, you can't expect that you can also learn the handwriting program and the writing program and start a brand new trajectory with ancient history. It's going to take you a little bit of time to familiarize yourself. Here's what's lucky about homeschool. We don't have to cover six or seven subjects in one day. We can clear the decks. We can say today, we're just gonna play with this math program. 
I'm going to read the instructions. I'm going to try a couple pages on my own. Why don't you guys go play with Legos while I do that? And when I'm ready, I'm going to invite you back and see if I can demonstrate to you what I learned. And then you guys tell me if I'm making sense or not. See what I mean? You can experiment with the curricula yourself. You can play with the curricula. The curricula doesn't own you. It's a tool towards your educational objective. So go ahead, get familiar, jump in, take risks, explore it. Do that during real time. Do it with one program at a time. Give it the old college try before you ditch it. And if all your friends online are talking about how awesome all these other programs are, make a list because you're going to want to know, but don't buy them yet. Give the ones that you've already spent your hard-earned money on a chance to work before you dump them, okay? And then if you do need to dump them, which we're going to talk about in a minute, you'll have your list ready and you can go try it then. So are we all on board so far? We know what the, I'm going to review. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. And these are our points so far. There's no such thing as open and go, except handwriting books. <laughs> Everything else requires a little bit of preparation. So, prepare! Right in the middle of the homeschool day, right in front of your kids, after your cup of tea or coffee, okay? Three, give it the old college try. Don't give up until you've let it live in your family for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And then lastly, introduce one new thing at a time. Don't try and spin all the plates at once or they'll start crashing around your feet, right? We talked about that last week. Okay, good. Let's keep going. All right. So what about curricula that isn't working? How do we decide that mm, it really isn't right for us? Well, there are a few criteria for that. First of all, one of the most common and undervalued is this one, boredom. Boredom is a valid reason to dump a curricula. Who knows that's true? Or let's put it a different way. Write in the comments if you feel guilty giving up a curricula because you're bored. Put a thumbs up or a yes, anyone? Oh, I see lots of hearts, so this must be resonating. That's right. A lot of times we feel guilty that we feel bored. If you are on your fourth child teaching reading, it's not surprising that you want to use a different system than you used for your first three kids because you're sick of it. And it's all right. You get to decide your happiness, your investment, and your enthusiasm are the engines of your homeschool, not the curriculum. So the one that really, you know, turned you on and excited you with your first child just may not be interesting to you by your fourth child. It's okay, go on a hunt, find something else. It's all right to take a risk and see if another program would work, okay? But not only is your boredom something to be worried about, but your kid's boredom matters too. And that, is my next reason for getting rid of a curricula. Ask your kids, do you like this? One of the worst situations that I've encountered is when a parent loves a curriculum that the kids hate. How many of you have experienced that? Anyone? Who's experienced the feeling that there is this program that, oh, if you could have been homeschooled, you would have used it, but your kids are like, eh, it's not that interesting to me. Let's see. Anybody? Yep. Yep. Sigh. Yep. Exactly. Sometimes the program that reassures you or enlivens you or inspires you is not the one that does any of that for your kids. And that's a problem because now you're at a crossroads. You're like, well, I really love this and my kids don't like it. And it makes me happier to use it, so what? I'm gonna force my kids? Or conversely, you've got kids who are like whipping through a book, but you're bored by it. You're not sure it's really teaching the way you thought teaching should happen. How do you make a decision? Any ideas? How have you made that decision? What do you do when you have a bored child with a curriculum 
or, I mean, not bored, excuse me, a child who doesn't like a curriculum that you love or a curriculum that you don't like but your child loves. How have you handled that? Some people, oh, Jen says, what if they're just bored by the subject? Oh, great question. Remind me of that. We'll do it again. Ask, what do you like? Good. Yes. Change up parts which are flexible. Oh, my gosh. Angela, perfect. You guys are getting it. Keep coming. I know you're smart. I don't have all the answers. Yeah, trade, compromise, go with the kids. Look at recommendations for others. Uh, conquer and divide. They do the teaching. Respect opinions. Let the learner decide. Some people have required it anyway. Okay, so there are some good suggestions here. Let me throw out a couple more and see if these help you. So one thing is, first, establish what is the goal. So let's say the goal is learning to read. And it's a program that you're not interested in using, but it's working for your child. Well, can you involve an older child to take some of the read aloud duty? Can you involve the other parent? Can you ask the child to do one day using that program and another day using something that's more satisfying to you? We are talking about compromise. We're also talking about talking. <laughs> because here's the thing, and this goes back to my little point here about do they like this? We tend to form our opinions of curriculum in a private, secret place, our brains. Our kids aren't in on all that conversation. They're busy living their lives. They're not on the internet doing homeschool curriculum research, right? They're just playing. They're showing up in the morning after their bowl of Cheerios and they're thinking to themselves, huh, I guess I'm gonna do homeschool today. <laughs> and you come along and say, hey, I've got this fabulous program for you. And the child doesn't even realize that there was a reason to switch, doesn't know what it's about. So getting your kids in on that journey is really important. So if you are truly passionate and attached to a certain program or philosophy, I kind of trust you. There's a reason it inspired you, but your kids may not have gone on that journey with you. So make some tea and let them in on the journey. You can do this even at a five-year-old level. You can say things like, you know what? I was talking with all these other moms and this is what they did with their kids. And it just, it really struck me that that's something we've never done. I wonder if we could do that. Do you think we could do that? What would it be like if we X, Y, Z? Do you see? You've got to sort of lay a foundation before you just dump something on the heads of your children. You want to create this opportunity for them to invest. We would never, ever want to be sold over a telemarketer call the way we usually present curriculum to our children, right? We don't want to just require them to stay on the phone because we've got this, you know, fast talking, you know, belief about this one program. What we really want is for our kids to own it, to be interested, to be curious, to be willing to take a risk. So, Think about that next time when you're at this crossroads. Likewise, let's say they're very invested in a program that you're like, ho-hum, I don't think this is a good program. Have them sell you. Say, you know what? I'm finding myself uneasy with this program. Can you tell me why you love it and what's working about it for you? And have this dialogue. Do you know what that means? You're teaching them what I call the meta look at their education. They're like poised above it looking down at it and thinking through what leads them to be a learner. And isn't that really our goal? So don't just treat them like you're doing homeschool to them. Involve them even in the dialogue of what philosophy of education is effective with them. Use childlike language. I'm not expecting you to use, you know, sophisticated academic elite discourse. Just talk to them. Talk to them like they're your friends. <laughs> And then lastly, my last point is that we want a variety of delivery systems. That's another valid reason to switch. So let's say you inadvertently got so swept up in all the conversation in your favorite homeschool discussion place, whether it's an in-person support group or it's one of the online discussion communities that you frequent, 
and you suddenly got swept up in this enthusiasm and, uh-oh, every single subject is being taught with a workbook. Has that ever happened to you? You suddenly look down and it's like workbook city and you're the mayor, right? That isn't a great way to conduct your homeschool. And here's why. Because it's assuming that all education comes through the portal of handwriting and reading, and it isn't the way it all comes. Some comes from experiences, field trips, interaction with experts, tactile kinesthetic involvement. So when you're looking at your curriculum choices, even if it's touted as the best one you've ever seen, if it's a repeat in the kind of delivery system, don't get it. Or get rid of the one that's comparable and replace it with something that comes from another perspective. You know, when we were doing science growing up with my kids between like kindergarten and sixth or eighth grade, I never bought a science workbook, not one, because we used them for, you know, math. We had Wordly Wise. Uh, my kids really loved those like riddle puzzle kinds of books, so they used those. And I just didn't want to treat science like it was just one more page you fill in when really it's about this big bad world that we live in, right? Big beautiful world. <laughs> So what we would do is we would just go to the library and we would pick what I'd call, you know, sciencey topics, you know, weather, animals, uh, you, you know, anything. Uh, we did a whole thing on birds, astronomy. We would just pick a subject, the human body, and we'd bring home nonfiction books. And then we would find experiments that we could do with our hands, or we would use practices like binoculars for observing birds or we would get the telescope and look at the sky. We went on nature hikes. That's how we did science because I didn't want, yes, exactly. Science is staying up late to watch a super moon eclipse, exactly. We did the same thing when we were studying geography and the globe. We made foods from different countries. We went to international supermarkets. We tried dressing up in their clothes. I remember when Johanna taught us how to put on saris, for example, with a big long piece of fabric. We didn't just look for curricula. Sometimes we were just looking for a key to turn the lock to create curiosity and interest and investigation. So just remember, you want a variety of delivery systems, okay? So those are my actual tips. We flew through this today, but I have a pro tip. And this is for all of you who've stayed to the end. So if you want to bring in your friends, you can still swipe right or up and share with your other friends. Here comes the pro tip, and then we'll have the special code for discounts. Okay, here's the pro tip. You control your curriculum. It doesn't control you. You control your curriculum. It doesn't control you. You dictate your homeschool. Your homeschool doesn't dictate to you. I like to say when I speak at conventions that there was never a homeschooled child who has ever missed a math problem. Did you know that? There's not one homeschooled child on the planet who has ever missed a math problem. Now, I know you're scratching your head and you're thinking, my child just missed a math problem this morning. I think she's crazy. Oh, no. Here's what I know. Every child in homeschool who misses a math problem has a mother who makes that child rework the problem. How many of you know that's true? Everyone? <laughs> you don't let them miss problems. You correct and rework them every single time. This is what homeschooling parents do. Does that happen in school? No. Sometimes they just get three wrong and they move on. I love this because it's absolutely the truth. We just won't allow for errors to ever occur. Why do I bring this up? Because I want to give you permission to let your kids get some math problems wrong or to skip some problems or to not do all the chapters or to take one test and not another or to do some of their work orally. In other words, it's great that we have this standard because we care so much about understanding. That's why we always rework everything. On the flip side of that, you do need to allow the mind to go fallow in between risks and attempts sometimes. And the curriculum doesn't get to decide. You get to decide. Is your child exhausted? 
Did she get, you know, 18 out of 20 right? Maybe those two weren't so problematic. They were just a momentary glitch, a little calculation error. You can move on. So yes, allow for risks and attempts to be validated. Exactly. Not only that, schools never finish the books. Now I know you've all heard that. That's really common parlance around homeschools. And we still don't use that information to our empowerment. We still typically go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't finish the book, but I'm going to. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, you don't have to. What you're doing between kindergarten and eighth grade especially is you are introducing your kids to ideas and skills, to books and methods of learning. That's what you're doing. And you're going to recircle over the same information and practices over and over. They're going to hit it again, and they're going to hit it again, and they're going to hit it again. It's okay with me if you decide how to use the curricula and it violates the original instructions that you've already read during the real time of your homeschool <laughs> and that you've already tried it, right? So that's what I want you to take away from this. You're the queen. I, I, let me just tell you a funny story because it just occurred to me and I, it's one of my favorites. So when I first moved to Ohio, I joined this homeschool support group that was local. And we all had to come to the meetings, you know, once a month. And occasionally women would bring their husbands with them. And everybody, there's like 80 women in this group, and everybody would introduce themselves and if they brought their husbands, their husbands. And so they would say things like this. My name is Annie. I am the homeschooling mom. And I brought the principal of our homeschool with me. His name is Dan. And then everyone would laugh. And I remember thinking, no, that is not the case. So when it got to me, I said, hello, I'm Julie Bogart. I'm the principal, teacher, and curriculum designer of my homeschool. This is my husband, John. He's the janitor. <laughs> and that was the truth. He ran all the housekeeping. I ran the homeschool. And I want you to have that empowerment right now. You are the principal. You are the curriculum designer. You are the chief educator of your children. The buck stops with you. Yes, it's a terrifying, awesome responsibility, but it's also incredibly liberating. You get to decide. So treat these curricula pieces like what they are, aids to your overall educational goals, not the engine behind your homeschool. You're the engine behind your homeschool. Okay, so we got through all of the points. The pro tip just to remind you then is you control your curricula. It doesn't control you, okay? All right, we are now at the end. So I have two things I wanna share. Oh, you guys, it's great how you're all defining what your husbands are great at. <laughs> and I didn't mean to denigrate mine, but he was actually proud of being the janitor, so just so you know. All right, so here's some really, oh, somebody's saying they'd love to hear my favorite curricula in various subjects. I'm happy to share that, and maybe we'll do that at some point, but you need to know this. I've been out of homeschooling for a little while and a lot has changed. And so even though I have some diehard standards, like I shared that I love Winston grammar and I still, compared to every other program I've seen, I prefer it. I still don't know what all is out there in its wide variety. And so I trust you all to help each other. And what I prefer to do is give you the rails. Remember how I talk about the rails that your homeschool runs on? That's what I'm good at. I'm good at being a coach. I like helping you figure out the principles that help you make good decisions. That seems to be the thing that I can offer at this point. Um, but you know, maybe we'll do that for fun someday. Okay, so here's something really weird that's been going on since we started this whole Periscope thing. So many people started using the word enchanted. In fact, I would love it if you all would follow at not before seven, the at sign, not before seven. She is a blogger who just did, and we'll put this in our blog post so you can look it up in the show notes later. Um, anyway, she just did her very first Periscope showing her enchanted living space based on the enchanted education scope I did. She walks through, yes, not before seven, that's it, perfect. Um, she walks through her house and I'm not kidding you, that place is so fabulous for learning. She took a table and painted it 
um, turquoise blue and then put, um, what is it called? Blackboard paint on the surface of the table so you could write with chalk on it. It's brilliant. So go see hers. It's like in her catch replays, catch.me, catch with a K, dot me, backslash, not before seven. Go watch it. And then I'm hearing this word enchanted now popping up on your blogs in the Facebook Brave Writer Lifestyle page. So clearly this word enchantment has caught our att attention and imagination. So here's my challenge. Tomorrow's October. Let's use between tomorrow and next Friday for those of you to be brave and do your first or second or 15th scopes on enchantment. What's the pixie dust you're sprinkling on your homeschool? Is it the living space? Is it a poetry tea time? Is it some board game you're playing? It can be short. It can be five minutes. I'm not asking you to do a lot. But use this hashtag, Enchanted Scopes. Yes, Enchanted October, exactly. Use the hashtag Enchanted Scopes so I can find you on Twitter. Make sure your Twitter setting is on so I can find you. If you don't have Twitter and you do a scope, please email me, julie at bravewriter.com to tell me where to find you. I want to see your scopes, okay? And then we'll collect as many as we can and we'll put them in the blog. So you have from now until next Friday, okay? Let's do it. So enchanted scopes. All right. And then the very last thing, weirdly, we had set aside for October um, a discount. And I completely, literally forgot about it until about an hour or two before I was doing this scope. I realized, oh my gosh, it ties in with my topic and I didn't even plan it. The name of our sale in October is the October Oops, I Bought the Wrong Program Sale. <laughs> So here's our code for Brave Rider. If you want to buy any Brave Rider products, you get $15 off of any purchase. Oh, there's not before seven. Yay! We're promoting yours. <laughs> so anyway, you can buy any product that's over $50 for $15 off during the month of October on the Brave Rider website. This is the code. Oops, 15. It's the Oops October sale. And you can find the store at bravewriter.com. Okay? Oops, 15. Thank you. October, oops. Oops, I bought the wrong curriculum sale. Exactly. <laughs> We're hoping then that the right curriculum is mine. But, you know, read the instructions and give it a month. <laughs> and do it one at a time. All right, last thing. The Homeschool Alliance, my coaching community, has been booming since we started Scopes. And people keep asking me about it. How many Alliance members do we have watching right now? Um, if you're an Alliance member, just stick a thumbs up or a little waved hand or a yes, that's me. The Homeschool Alliance is where I give you personal coaching. Yay, here we go. Carolyn, Angela, yay, Eva, Jen, Rebecca. Very good. What we do there is we take this kind of material and we do a much deeper dive. I talk with you about your kids. You can ask me about programs you're using. We do brain-based learning. In fact, for October, we're taking the brain-based learning a lot deeper, and we're going to talk about it with your kids. So if you're interested in joining the Homeschool Alliance, this is the website, coachjuliebogart.com. When I say deep, what I mean is you get to read some material that I pre-select for you, and then I do audio lectures over the course of the month about that material. And then we have conversations. Yay, Kay, I'm glad you're in there too. So when you're in that community, you get to post only if you want to, you don't have to, your questions, your reflections. It's a community that creates not just accountability and even not just support, but new vision for what you want your homeschool to feel like. Not just what it should be doing, but what it feels like for you to have a rich life with your kids. So I would love to have you join us if you want to. CoachJulieBogart.com. Okay, well, that winds us up for today. Do we have any questions before we close off here? And I will happily field some. I'm new, but I love it already. Yay, I'm so glad. Oh, I have to listen to the replay. Well, go for it. You come back another time. Rebecca loves the homeschool line. She's a great contributor. Oh, 
Thank you for posting these comments. You guys are great. It's very helpful. Oh, thank you for my top. This is my little, I'm an educator top. <laughs> Heart Revolution says thanks. Thank you for being here. So it looks like maybe I've covered everything. I don't have any questions. Oh, how to ditch homeschool philosophies, not just curriculum. Oh my goodness, Angela. Angela, guess what my next scope is going to be? It's called Unschooling Undefined. And we're going to look at all the different homeschool philosophies, especially unschooling. That'll be Friday. So if you want to come for that, that's what we'll be doing. You are welcome for all your positive, the positive encouragement. Thank you. You guys are awesome. I love you. I always blow you a kiss. So let me remind you again, Julie Bogart, Brave Writer, the Homeschool Alliance, live honestly and write bravely. See you Friday.